we will go on, right? Uh, and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help, we managed to go on uh, till which surah? Hang on, let me tell you where we went on to. Uh, my memory is just gone to the dogs, really. Just give me a second. I'm just taking out my thing. Huh. So we reviewed from Surah Fatiha to Surah Al-An'am in Ramadan. And then we covered Surah Al-Araf. And right now we are doing uh, uh, Surah Al-Anfal, right? And uh, Surah Al-Anfal, because it's a commentary on the Ghazwa of Badr, the Battle of Badr, which was the first very major uh, victory for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions for the believers. And it was a turning point in the history of uh, uh, this fledgling community of uh, uh, believers. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has talked in great detail about the etiquettes of victory and about the etiquettes of celebration. So we talk a lot about how we celebrate various different things in the Quran. We talk about it in our sessions. So there are many, many questions related to the regular general celebrations that we have in our lives, right? So several people had asked, so you talk about celebrations, but how do we know what exactly to celebrate, right? And what not to celebrate. Mm -hmm. uh, birthdays is something that we always talk about because the, a, a specific question came from a listener, a student, who said that I know that some people do not celebrate birthdays, nor wish others and don't acknowledge the birthday. Is that what we are supposed to do, right? And similar questions keep coming about, say, anniversaries or various different wedding events that we have and the celebrations that we have, which are social or cultural, right? So best thing is to just kind of sit down and talk about it. So that is exactly what, inshallah, inshallah, what we will try to do over here, right? So let's begin. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ashalatu was Salamu Allah, Sayyidil Ambiya, you will Mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Habibina wa Shafi'ina Muhammad, wa ala Alihi was Shahbihi Ajma'in, Rabbi Yassir Walla to Assyria Kareem, Waftah Bil Haki in Nakal Fatahul Ali, Rabbi Shrahli Shwadri, Wayasiri Amri. وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةَ مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي آمين يَا رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ يَا غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمِ يَا رَحْمَ الرَّحِمِينَ يَا ذَا الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given all human beings a social animal. We know that, right? We all know that. That we are, why is this pandemic affecting us so much, a lot of us? is because of this social isolation. Social isolation is a terrible thing. I know of many people, this very, very, uh, uh, very dear people as well, who have been admitted to hospital, right? And not with COVID, with, with something else. And because nobody else would go with them, uh, it has been a double whammy. You know, it has been a very, very serious challenge. And I'm sure all of you have either been through that, uh, yourself in, in your own homes or have somebody very close to you, friends or family who've been through this social isolation, right? Because of either getting COVID or some other disease and then we are generally not meeting up. And that is not how human beings are. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has perhaps given, given us this pause, this opportunity to think about our social life, right? And celebrations are a big part of that, right? Big part of that, we love a party, right? I can raise both my hands, love a party. Don't you all? Don't we just like having friends and family around, right? Um, having a good time, having a good laugh, right? Etc. cetera, et cetera. Hmm? Now, what we need to do today is to find out, do we have guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about this extremely important aspect of our lives? of all the various different things that we celebrate or all the various different party time that we have. Is there guidance in our being about that? What do you guys think? Just a, little, just a raise of hands or maybe if somebody wants to share. Do you think there is guidance related to how we celebrate stuff? How we, uh, 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 you know, a, a big 
chunk of our life is in interaction with other people. And a big part of that interaction is various types of celebrations and commem commemorations, etc. So do you think that our deen, which is quote unquote, a complete way of life, it has some guidelines associated to this or not? Quickly, we have little time. Just anybody, do you think there is something there or this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, okay, uh, you can just <clears throat> go ahead and do as you please. Nobody's saying anything. Do you guys generally don't know or are a little shy to say or what's going on here? Should I repeat the question? Do, do you guys think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given us some guidance in matters of different various different celebrations in our lives or no, if they haven't. And we can do as we please. Okay, since nobody is replying, which is very strange. Okay, all right. Uh, but somebody raise their hand. Shazia Alam. Okay, Shazia. I think uh, examples how to and what to do in our daily lives and to celebrate. Okay, yeah. So yes, yes, absolutely. Because this is a very important aspect of our life, right? This is an extremely important aspect of our life. And how is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to leave it guidance free? Hmm? Our the whole idea of being a believer and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Are we only talking about formal worship? Because if we are only talking about formal worship in terms of our five salah, in terms of fasting in Ramadan, you know the five pillars, then how much time in our lives does it actually take? So if we look at our daily routine, if you take your five prayers, how long does it take to pray? Even if we are doing like tops, Five, five salah every day. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us steadfast on that. And for those of us who are still struggling with that, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to establish ourselves of these five salahs. So tops, let's say, what, an hour? For, for somebody, they might claim, I pray for two hours out of 24. Chalo, two hours. Kar lete. Chalo, let's do three hours. So then how many hours left in a day? In 24 hours? If you take three hours out? Yeah, or oh, somebody is saying something on the chat. Um, maximum one to two hours, okay. Maximum one to two hours. Yeah, absolutely. Totally maximum one to two hours. We still have the big chunk of our 24 hours, what to ourselves? What to do in that? Whatever, hari papa, hari puti. Whatever you feel like. No, absolutely not. How is that possible? How is that possible, right? Because if we are to live a life of submission, if we are to live an examined life, then every hour, every minute, every nanosecond is accounted for, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you do not do good an atom's weight, but you're going to see the khair of it, right? What am I what am I saying? So, so whatever good you do, even if it is atoms weight, you're going to see it in the akhirah. So every second counts, every day counts, right? There are various different kinds of activities and events that we like to celebrate, right? Or sometimes it, it's thrusted upon us as well, to be very honest. Yeah. So uh, roughly speaking, it could be like religious celebrations, like we have our Eids, what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has specifically told us that we have two Eids, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, right? And uh, Jum'ah is actually a day of celebration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a Friday once every week to be like Eid, right? Then we have various different social uh, occasions that we like to celebrate. And in the social occasions, you can bring in <clears throat> what various different birthdays. And now every year as time passes and as humanity is becoming more and more materialistic, right? So we have all kinds of days. Yeah. 
Secretary's Day and uh, Siblings Day, and I'm not mentioning the obvious Mother's Day, Father's Day, whatever day, right? Various different days that have been designated. Then we celebrate personal achievements. So you've got a new job, you've graduated. Now the graduations have also become such that, you know, uh, in a children, uh, in a in a child's academic career. Uh, back in the day, they used to have like one graduation, huh? college se graduate, kar gaya, alhamdulillah, mera beta, doctor, gaya, whatever. No, no, now, mera bicha jo hai, now he's graduating from class from, I don't know, kindergarten to grade one, then from grade five to grade six, whatever. There are various different milestones that we have. So there are several graduations. Uh, new job, new car, new home, whatever, all kinds of different achievements, losing weight, I don't know. Uh, maybe gaining weight should also be a personal achievement. And then we have commemorations, various different commemorations, right? Um, Earth Day, Women's Day. Um, I'm just mentioning some very uh, 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 popular ones around, right? Uh, and there are many. Hmm? And then we have some national celebrations as well, right? That in Pakistan, we have uh, uh, 14th August, right? We just had what, Defense Day or something? Uh, right, 6 September, uh, various different countries have their national days and national holidays, etc. And all of that is this whole package deal of celebrating it somehow. Oh, and how can I forget weddings? Oh my goodness, my pet peeve, right? So we have weddings which are social, uh, uh, religious, come for some personal achievement, whatever, right? So as social animals, we are tied in with each other and we love to have these celebrations. There's absolutely nothing wrong in that, right? Now, what we need to sift through is which of these celebrations that we normally see around us and we indulge in, which of them are okay to celebrate, right? And which of them are inherently not okay to celebrate, right? And the, there are certain celebrations which inherently may not have a problem. Yeah, but the way they are celebrated brings in certain elements which are not um, either not part of deen at all or not liked uh, uh, by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right. So these are the things that we need to be aware of. So to begin with, just as a start off, we need to know that in our deen of Islam, the origin of matters is permissibility unless and until there is, there is evidence from the Quran or Sunnah to the contrary. So we have our ibadats, which is our formal worship, and then everything else, which is our mu'amalats, right? Those of you who understand, who do understand what mu'amala means. <clears throat> so we have ibadat and mu'amalats, and alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is such that if we uh, do our mu'amalats in for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so that also become, becomes ibadat. Okay. In matters of ibadat, like salah, or uh, any ibadat that you think of, zakat, or hajj, or uh, etc., everything is impermissible until and unless it is permitted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? So the origin of ibadat is what? Only that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted. Clear cut, right? And the origin of ma'amalat is everything is permissible unless there is evidence on the contrary for that. Okay? So please keep that in mind. This is a golden thumb rule for all believers to truly understand and internalize. A lot of the matters get sorted out when we understand this principle. This is an original principle of our theme, right? And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made any hardships for us. For example, in, in many places in the Quran, Allah says that. He did not make any hardship for you in your deen, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Allah wants to lighten your burdens, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the famous ayat of the Quran, indeed, with hardship, there is ease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's default position in our ma'amalat is ease, to lighten the burdens. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, make things easy and do not make things difficult. Glad, give glad tidings and do not frighten people away, right? 
in another narration, uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, take people calm and do not frighten them away. This is in Bukhari and Muslim. This is a Muttafiqun Alayhi Hadith. Hmm? So um, when we read things like these, that inherently our deen is based on ease and our deen is based on permissibility when we talk about our mu'amalat. Hmm? Now we need to see that all of the stuff that we celebrate, what does it fall under, right? Is it difficulty in being for me personally? Because I am at a place or at, in that zone right now that I don't actually completely get it. What is the meaning of ease and difficulty? Or is it actually ease and I kind of, uh, what are the benefits of something which is permissible and what are the benefits of something which is impermissible? To understand this whole, whole concept, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the example in detail of birthdays. I'm not going to go into details of all other holidays, right? First of all, let's look at the example of the day that we were born. And then inshallah, inshallah, we will discuss a more general approach towards all the different things that we celebrate, et cetera, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So the thing is that there is hardly any dispute that birthday celebrations did not originate from monotheistic believers, did not originate, right? But were introduced among the monotheists from people who were not monotheist. The, Mushriks. the idea of recording one's birth date and keeping it well memorized is strongly tied to astrological fortune telling and horoscopes. The month and day a person was born in accordance with the constellations that were above them that night supposedly determined their personality and many events of their lives, right? The more influential the person's position, the greatest importance their birth date was given. Other traditions would take the numbers of the birth date and make predictions based on, on that. That is a very common thing among Hinduism even today. But historically, the earliest mentions of birthdays are in relation to gods and kings. As for the matter of celebration that we are familiar with today, like, you know, you have the cake and the candles and all of that shebang, right? Uh, some allege that they originated from pagan Germany the part that is Germany today, right? And there were many pagan superstitious beliefs that human beings were particularly vulnerable to evil spirits on the anniversary of their birth, on the day that they were born, right? To combat this, friends and family would greet the birthday person and offer gifts in an attempt to lift their mood and repel the evil spirits. So in other words, birthdays were seen as something particularly depressing and to uh, kind of, make light of them or to lift them out of that depression, there was a celebration. So, yeah. The Germanic pagans even attached, who were very attached to nature, uh, quote unquote, Mother Earth, are believed to have adopted specifically round birthday cakes because the shape is symbolic of the circular nature of life, right? The turning of seasons, you know, becoming, uh, beginning weak at birth, then becoming strong and then return, re returning to weakness in old age, you know, that circle of life and the circularity of the sun and the moon, uh, both of whom they worshipped. Pagans also believed that smoke, which they would pray into, would rise up to their gods in the skies, and therefore they used candles, right? Made a prayer or made a wish and blew into them in hopes that the gods would receive the smoke and would, would watch over them and their prayers, and concerns would be addressed more effectively. Right? So um, blowing out candles in one breath was a stronger guarantee. Now, ancient Greeks were the first to use candles on their cakes, a representative of the moon goddess Artemis, right? Who is often depicted with a crescent-shaped bow in front of the moon. Pagans also might smear the name of the birthday person on the cake to prevent bad luck and jealousy from touching that individual. This is also likely what led to goodie bags for guests, repelling jealousy so that everyone gets something although this custom is still practiced today in some places, right? 
and again, party snappers, balloons, whistles, um, to scare, scare away evil spirits and to bring cheer. And then, you know what we call birthday bumps, birthday spankings and other minor bruisings were meant to drive out ill spirits. And many songs and traditions associated with birthday parties were also based on magic and the estimation of luck for the coming year. So for example, a birthday hat in the shape of a cone is essentially the same as a witch's cone hat, right? And by the way, I'm not making any of this up. And by the way, all of this history has not been dug out by any <clears throat> Muslim scholar also, right? Uh, you can read this book, uh, which is called Ralph and Adeline Linton in the Lore of Birthdays, uh, which was written. Uh, I will inshallah share the link on your WhatsApp group. So now celebrating birthdays is common today, right? Among many, many people, whether Christian or agnostic. However, the sentiment of some early Kitabi scholars further establishes that birthday celebrations clearly came from outside monotheistic traditions and was not quite welcome, right? Because astrology is also condemned in the Bible, right? So birthday celebrations were given the same ruling. Another part of the reason came from biblical sentiment, right? Birthdays are mentioned few times. In Genesis, the Pharaoh's birthday is celebrated and he executes his baker. Perhaps he didn't like the cake or something, right? Ayub alayhi salam is seen expressing great, because who are these Ayub alayhi salam and, uh, and uh, Yahya alayhi salam? The prophets of the Bani Israel, right? So this is in the Old Testament. Ayub is seen expressing great concern over his children when he learns that they celebrated their birthdays. And again in Matthew, on King Herod's birthday celebration, he grants a woman's wish and she was like, uh, she's recorded as being a dancing girl, that she asked him to be head Yahya salam, John the Baptist, right? So all of this was happening In medieval times, in extension of Rome, Egyptian, and Persian traditions, only the birthdays of nobility were celebrated, right? Celebrating birthdays among Christians did not become commonplace until the fourth century, when the religion was under heavy influence from Roman leaders. And the faith spread without persecution, and people embraced it or were forcibly registered as Catholics quicker than pagan traditions could be eradicated, right? Today, among Christians, Jehovah's Witnesses still do not celebrate birthdays. Okay. Now, why are we having this history lesson? Because we want to see that a lot of social celebrations, right, or cultural celebrations have roots in paganism, right? That, that's what we are trying to say over here. Now, birthday celebrations had not spread among the Arabs before Islam, nor did the Muslims during Rasulullah's time discuss it either positively or negatively, it was a non-issue. It was absolutely a non-issue. While censuses and record keeping existed for the sake of zakats, for the sake of conscription, for jizya, uh, and other details that demanded such records, birth and deaths do not seem to be specifically noted. And you must, uh, I'm sure most of you have family members, elders, who to this day, actually do not know what their birthday is, right? Because it was something which was not considered significant. So it's common that even among scholars and kings, the place and year of birth, much less the day, is subject to great dispute, right? It's very common. Most Muslims, for example, believe that Omar, uh, Abu Bakr and Omar each lived to be like 63 years old. What they don't know is for each of them, there are nearly a dozen other opinions uh, from their contemporaries about how old they each lived, how old they really were, based on different opinions of their birth years. And such dispute is common and prevalent for nearly all companions, scholars, and noteworthy individuals for the first three centuries, several centuries, right? When the Muhaddithin started collecting ahadith, they would focus on when the person died because there usually was no record of when he was born, right? All this clearly shows that noting a child's date of birth was not 
custom. It wasn't customary. Now, it is very important to understand this. And I'm going to, after giving you all of this history, this does not mean that celebrating a birthday is a religious innovation. Religious innovation is what? Bid'ah. It doesn't mean that at all. Even for Muslims, because there are obviously some benefits concerning rights and privileges. Even for Muslims in the signs of puberty, if signs of puberty are delayed, Rasulullah wasallam instructed us that children become Islamically accountable adults, mukallifun, they come, become mukallif after they are 15 lunar years old, about 14 and a half solar for boys, right? For girls, it's uh, puberty is like uh, period. Only Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself was known to be born in the year of the elephant, probably the second Monday in Rabi ul Awwal. So what the Islamic concerns are, are number one problems of superstitious beliefs. We are taking the example of birthdays. This would be true for any celebration that we talk about. It is a bid'ah. We just talked about that, that most certainly it is not a bid'ah. It is not an innovation in being, right? The other concern is that believers should not imitate disbelievers because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam explicitly said that. We will talk about that a little more. And another concern is that this may lead, like birthday celebrations, may lead to other haram or evil activity. So do understand one thing. This was the history. These are the Islamic concerns, right? There is another thing which is called legal opinion in our deen, right? If in our ma'amalats, there is permissibility until and unless there is no spe special prohibition for it. So when it comes to birthdays, we don't find that, right? We don't find that. But also understand that Islam as a faith is fundamentally based on being different from polytheist and mushriks. And you know, although none of their practices, we don't have, we don't have the right to belittle anybody's practices. But we need to be different from that, and we need to have this uh, position of making dawa. According to one scholar, just as shaitan fooled one generation centuries ago does not mean he cannot fool our own, nor that our descendants if we let our guard down, especially uh, when such a lot of cultural uh, practice around us is doing completely contrary to what we see as the practice of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Sahaba, right? And consider how Shaitan was patient with the people of Noah Alaihi Wasallam, waiting generation after generation, misleading them gradually towards shirk. It doesn't happen overnight, right? Okay, oh, sorry. For every superstitious practice, belief or idea that appears silly to us, we may find otherwise intelligent people hold that idea in their hearts or even propagate it. So consider how many families teach their children to believe in Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, and various practices to guarantee good luck, like picking up coins that are heads up while leaving those that are heads down, making a wish and tossing a coin in a pond or a fountain, or pulling on a turkey's wishbone, Avoiding the number 13. There are places where they don't they don't put floor number 13. Yeah. They, they just don't write it. Right? The, the, people take that quite seriously, yeah. These kind of things. Most parents know that if adults explain something to their children, their children will believe. Now, when they become adults and they disagree or have their own opinion, that's another thing. But as parents, we do form their opinions. And some parents misuse this important privilege and trust by creating false ideas in the minds of their offspring. Or the parents assume that because they know it is just pretend, that their children also think it is just pretend, right? Now, Ibrahim salam, understood this. And thus, he was persistent in making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect himself, even himself and his children from worshipping idols. And even after the children of Israel witnessed the power of God on numerous occasions, you know, the Bani Israel, we talked about them, you might have heard about them, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests 
his miracles in front of them, right? But they still ended up worshiping the cow, right? And their descendants worshiped idols throughout the history. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam foretold that a portion of his followers would worship idols and that the day of resurrection would not come until some Arab tribes resurrect and worship ancient idols. Right? So while many believing families acknowledge this problem of shirk and acknowledge the effect <clears throat> uh, of mm, mushrik practices that can that, that that can have on our faith, right? Uh, there seem to be many of us who are on less guard than others with regard to superstitious practices, right? So you're going to have, uh, you know, perhaps that there are many, uh, say, believers in Malaysia who even go to temples, right? In Pakistan, we see that we have this big time grave worship going on. Hmm? And we don't even consider that, that the, the, that is also a, sort of an horse of somebody who's died is also like a huge big celebration. And in the province of Sindh, uh, because I live in Karachi, right? In the province of Sindh, we actually have designated government holidays for the horse of certain people, right? There's a, there's a holiday for that. Um, yeah, so we don't connect the dots sometimes. Hmm? We don't connect the dots. So coming back to this legal ruling, as was noted, birthday celebrations were unheard of during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and even the first three generations. So there is no early preserved opinion regarding them, good or bad, much less consensus, nor any specific nash from the Quran and Sunnah. This word nash, which is a clear legal injunction or a divine decree or written law or textual proof. We don't have that, right? So their ruling is left to the general umum texts of the Sharia and something which is called qiyas, which means analogical reasoning as applied to the deduction of judicial principles from the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay? I hope I'm making sense and not going too fast for you guys, right? Because this is individually derived ishtihad, it is not binding on you and me unless all or majority qualified mujtahids, mujtahids implicitly agree upon it. But that hasn't happened. So when it comes to whether we should celebrate birthdays or not in terms of the legality of it, you will definitely see a position of difference, clear difference. There are many scholars who absolutely categorically say not allowed. And there are many scholars absolutely and categorically say allowed, right? So whatever position I take or you take, right? That is going to be the onus on me and the onus on you. Legally speaking, if anybody is celebrating a birthday, right? They are not going outside of the injunctions of the Sharia. That's very clear. That's very clear, right? Now, because we talked about the fact that is a legal ruling, right? So please, people like me and you who have very little knowledge and very basic knowledge should avoid getting into this issue of astaghfirullah haram or every other thing that we don't understand. So if somebody is saying happy birthday to you, right? You don't turn around and say astaghfirullah haram. Yeah, simple as that. You may not be celebrating birthdays yourself. Fine, great. No problem, that is your position. But if some other believer's position is that they are, then you have no right to say asafarullah haram, right? When it comes to certain celebrations, remember I said in the beginning that there are certain celebrations which are inherently problematic. And we will come to that, that uh, what the Islamic concerns are. It is not a bid'ah, no problem. Yes, problematic in terms of superstitious beliefs. So like, you know, a little child, you're telling them, make a wish on the candle and blow out. God knows what idea is forming in their heads. And God knows what, what idea is forming in our heads. So modern birthdays are a far cry from the obvious and well-known and preserved pagan elements that we talked about, right? Whereas Halloween is not. Whereas Valentine's Day is not. So they are inherently problematic, right? So they are inherently not allowed by majority, majority of uh, scholars even today. 
Bhaitari is on the other hand are really obscured in that sense, so much so that even many religious and conservative Muslims automatically adopted it without thinking twice because there is nothing apparently suspect about it. Right? Gift giving and family gatherings cannot be grouped with that in any way. Like pure superstition, like uh, uh, without any good other than a placebo effect, like knocking on wood or carrying a rabbit's foot or avoiding walking, walking under ladders, opening the umbrella indoors, right? Or what else? Uh, black cats uh, turning away from one's plans based on birds, you know, things like that. So you can't lump them together. Having said that, what we need to understand clearly is the question of Muslim identity. <clears throat> you understand the difference between legality and, and, and cultural practice and how can we go about it in a way that preserves our original identity? That is why I was saying that we are looking at one prototype. We are looking at birthdays. There are so many various different celebrations. So I specifically mentioned Halloween and Valentine's Day. I will specifically mention Mayu and Mehndi that we have in our part of the world uh, as a wedding celebration. Those are specifically based in uh, religious beliefs. The symbols, the pila joda, the, the, the specific, uh, uh, what do you call like, you know, the, the various different uh, activities that are done in those, uh, uh, in those functions, in those events. It's, it, it, it's a template, isn't it? You do this and this and this, and there's a pan ka patta that is, you know, uh, the bride wears a certain color and there's a certain stuff goes on. Those are all based on very, very clear polytheist religious practices, right? So everyone clear on that, right? In terms of an overall celebration, this is not said by, a, 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 by someone. The problem that is happening that we are facing today as believers is that we feel that there is an incompatibility between Islam and surrounding culture. And that is a greater threat to you and me than paganism. That is a greater threat because we are completely losing our identity. Our deen is about our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we submit to God, we are Muslim. That is a connection of the heart. But we know as we go over the Quran, as we go over our texts, as we go over Rasulullah's instructions, that there is another part to it. There is an outward practice as well. Just like each and every mode of worship in our deen has an inward and an outward. Shala has the inward khushu, which is that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it also has the outward, you do your wudu correctly, you have your dress code properly, right? You face the Kaaba, you have certain very specific and specified motions that you go through. That is what is called salah. You know? So we cannot disregard either. We cannot disregard the outer or disregard the inner. Both are necessary. Both are important. And when it comes to celebrations, it is an outward thing, right? It is an outward thing. If I feel that I have chosen a way of life and my deen is so incompatible with all the cultural happenings around me, and what a shame, right? Why is it like that? I wish it wasn't like that. Somehow let me Islamicize, quote unquote, everything around me and yet be part of everything. That's something to think about. That's something to think about. If I am feeling embarrassment, if I am on the back foot constantly trying to explain, no, 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 but I'm, you know, uh, it's all right, you know, it's okay, there's not going to be anything happening, right? That, that, that's something to think about. That is, what is going on over here? Have I not recognized myself as who I am truly? Yeah. And this, somebody said, who's not even a Muslim, by the way, why do people get attached to so much made up stuff and then manufacture emotions to support that attachment? Is it that people just choose to live a lie because they fear being shunned away by society? Right? And do people wonder about this and just not talk about it? 
So actually, there are many people in this dunya, not believers, who are questioning the validity and the celebration of various different, uh, very established events and, uh, uh, and happenings, etc. They're like, why is it? I mean, uh, this, this materialistic attitude towards all these days that we celebrate, all of these days that we celebrate. There's somebody uh, just last, uh, uh, let me take that out for you, it's on my phone. Somebody had put up this really funny meme about Mother's Day. And they said, oh, I didn't post a picture with my mom today to get my love for her validated by people on the internet. Will the society accept me now? So a lot of times we get involved in quote unquote celebrations because everybody else is doing it because we are almost expected to do it as being members of this society. We want to be, we don't want to be ostracized, right? We get these reminders from all over the place about this day and that day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we feel that I need to be part of this uh, bandwagon, you want to call it or whatever. We don't have the strength to stand on our Muslim identity and see what is it that I can adopt and what is it that I don't need to. And I'm not talking about legality over here. I'm talking about what is it that I don't need to, right? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to great lengths actually, went to great lengths to establish a very specific Muslim identity, right? So we see that when they, uh, uh, when they came into Medina and the mosque was established, the question of how do we call people to prayer was there, yeah? So somebody suggested uh, uh, that let's use a bell to call to play a prayer like you have in churches, yeah? Uh, that somebody also uh, suggested let's do like a conch thing uh, to call people, right? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam disliked the idea because it, he said it resembled the Christian practice, right? Then, alhamdulillah, there was a Sahabi there was two Sahaba uh, actually, Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abi Rabah, as well as Umar bin Khattab ta'ala an, who saw this dream of this person saying the Adhan. And that is how the Adhan was established as the Islamic call to prayer, right? This is reported in so many traditions that uh, the possibility of it being wrong is quite zero. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina, he found the Jews fasting on the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram. They used to say this is a great day on which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa alayhi salam and drowned the people of Fir'aun. And Musa alayhi salam observed the fast on this day as a sign of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I am closer to Musa alayhi salam than they are, right? So he observed the fast on that day and ordered the Muslims to fast on that day. Then... He said, fast on the day before and the day after the Ashura so that it is differentiated from the fasting of the Jews. Hmm? One fear that we have when we talk about being different doesn't mean that you sit, uh, two things, right? Doesn't mean that you hate monger against the other, quote unquote. Right? And doesn't mean that you sit on such a moral high horse that you delegate everybody else as a safrullah haram kafir going to Jahannam. Have that very clear. That is not what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba did. Distinct identity of a Muslim is directly related to what we celebrate. Allah Iqbal said, na, apni mayyat, uh, apni ummat par qiyas Judge not your nation on the criteria of Western nations. And Aqwam Maghrib or Western nations is not talking about physically Western nations because Alhamdulillah, there are many believers all over the world. It's talking about an ideology, it's talking about a way of life, right? Special in composition is the Hashmi poets, uh, prophet's nation. When we lose that pride of being the nation and the ummah of the best of creation, that is something which affects our faith directly, which affects the state.
state of our heart directly. And that is what is problematic, problematic about celebrations that take us away from this identification, right? That is really, really problematic about it. Uh, and this is something which everybody understands universally. There is this book, which is called, We Are What We Celebrate. It is not, again, written by a Muslim. Uh, I'll share this uh, 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 book thing with you as well. So if you want to check it out yourselves. From community solidarity to ethnic relations to religious traditions. We Are What You Celebrate argues that holidays such as Halloween, 4th of July, Thanksgiving, New Year's Eve, and Valentine's Day, uh, this is specifically related to the United States of America, they play an important role in reinforcing and sometimes redefining our values as a society. The collection brings together classic and original essays that for the first time op offer a comprehensive overview and analysis of the important role such celebrations play in maintaining a moral order, as well as in cementing family bonds, building community relations, and creating a national identity. It's a question of identity, right? So these essays cover all of this, right? Compelling and often surprising, this look at holidays and rituals brings new meaning to not just the ways we celebrate, but to what those celebrations tell us about ourselves and about our communities. So when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that we have two Eids, right? Eid al-Fitr uh, and Eid al-Adha. That doesn't mean that he closed the doors to all other celebrations, but it means that that is the supreme celebration in the year of a believer, right? It's very important to contemplate and think about that. Very important. So what do we do then? What do we do then? Do we have any guidelines? Hmm? We talked about that. And so what should we do? How do we sift through everything? The first thing is to change the template, right? something which is inherently problematic, like celebrating the horse of a, a, a God-fearing person who's now been delegated God knows what kind of a position by believers, right? That is something which cannot be Islamicized in any way. That is inherently wrong. That is inherently impermissible, okay? When it comes to, like I said, Halloween or Valentine's Day, or uh, other religious celebrations uh, of other religions, right? Uh, Christmas, Easter, uh, uh, what, what other celebrations? Diwali, Holi, uh, what other religious celebrations? Whatever other religious celebrations are, that is inherently not for the believer. You know, there's no, there's no two ways about it. There's absolute consensus among scholars about that. Now, there are certain scholars who for people who are living in, say, Christian majority areas or whatever, right? They say that, you know, saying happy holidays, etc., is fine. Whereas there are many, many Muslims, many, many believers living in Muslim majority areas who don't do that, right? And you would be surprised to know that many a times there is no issue in that. You are not ostracized because of that. In fact, a lot of times people give you respect for holding on to your belief system and for holding on to your identity, right? So this, this thing that we have in our head that I'm going to be ostracized, that I'm going to be like, look, I, I, I'm going to be a freak if I don't go to this Mendy or if I don't say Merry Christmas or whatever. And in Muslim majority areas, there is absolutely no need for celebrations that are totally not part of our deen like other religions celebrate. Now, if there are those other religions living in our lands, which are majority Muslim lands, they are free to celebrate the way they wish. And they should not in any way be prosecuted because of that, because that is their choice. They have made their choice to choose another way of life, to choose another religion, right? So as believers, it is our duty not to prosecute them or to uh, you know, uh, even be mean to them about it. And in fact, the, the governments have this duty to protect them uh, legally from any kind of hooliganism, et cetera. And unfortunately, the reason I'm saying that is because it happens in our country, in Pakistan, right? But that should not happen. We cannot ransack other people's places of worship, right? That is the choice that we are making. We are most certainly going to make dawa to them, right? But it doesn't mean that we will not allow them to celebrate their religious celebrations. Okay? As far as you and I are concerned, 
change the template. So since we were talking about birthdays, how do we change the template? Do we have to have a birthday with like, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the same format? Every celebration seems to have a format, right? And we talked about where the format is coming from. We don't have to have that format, right? You can say happy birthday to each other, and do what? To shukur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I fast on Mondays because it is my birthday. You want to follow the sunnah to the T, fast every, uh, every uh, week of the day or maybe just once that year when it is your birthday. Yeah, that would be cool, right? You want to have friends over, you want to exchange gifts, alhamdulillah, no problem. Take out, the because like I said, legally, it's not an issue, it's a question of identity. So if there are two options, right? One is completely let go, don't do it at all, right? But if somebody wishes you, don't have be like daggers drawn and start the safurullah haram thing, yeah? And if you are celebrating, if you're, you know, everybody is at a different uh, spectrum in terms of practice of being. Hmm? Understand that your Muslim identity is as important the outside Muslim identity, as your inner faith and your connection with God. It is as important because if it wasn't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have prescribed a dress code for women as well as for men. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have given us a specific way of praying or a specific way of fasting. So the outside is important. I will keep repeating that. So the outside of celebrations are very, very important. Any element that you feel is going to compromise that Take that out if you are so uh, sort of inclined towards celebrating because you're so used to it. And because the uh, culture is telling you, because this peer pressure, this whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So then don't institute, don't push that little child to, okay, now hold your breath and blow out the candles together and make a wish. That's problematic. Yeah, that's, problem that's problematic. And a lot of times we see when children are very young, what are birthday parties all about? It's about the mother showing off, really. It's about, and now, I'm, Alhamdulillah, I'm sure there are many people who have a simple affair or whatever, but generally speaking, it's like our celebrations are actually not celebrations, but our competitions, really. We get into this crazy competition. Who's going to get what on the goodie bag? What kind of cake? What theme? What? Blah, blah, blah. There's no end to it. There's no end to it. Then you do get into this israf, this overspending, this extravagance. You do get into elements that are just disliked in our deen and outright haram also. So a lot of dance and music, uh, a lot of uh, mixing of the sexes in a way that it shouldn't be perhaps drinking or smoking or whatever, right? There, there are many, many elements that creep into a, which could have been a simple celebration, right? That is something that the template needs to be changed. Why do you want to follow a format? We like to be pioneers in everything, don't we? Especially young people. Be a pioneer in this. Have your Muslim identity, right? Weddings, look at weddings, right? You have to sit and wear that pila joda without question. Nobody questions it. All the brides that sit in that pila joda, have we ever questioned, are bhai why, are bhai kyu? And we are intelligent, thinking human beings, right? fancy degrees from fancy universities. And yet, when it comes to cultural traditions, cultural celebrations, we don't have the call to question. That's, that's super, super problematic at many levels, at many, many levels, right? So think about it. Why am I doing this? A believer's life is an examined life. A believer's choices are specific choices, informed choices. Why are you getting married like that? So the pandemic again was an opportunity where Alhamdulillah many people had simple nikahs. Yeah. Right? Hello, can you hear me? There was some problem with my connection. Ofera, uh, uh, can you hear me? Can someone tell me can you hear me? Uh, can, can just somebody raise their hands and tell me that you can hear me or just focus somebody's typing? Yeah, you can. Okay, just Akala Ofer. It was, there was some problem with my connection. Okay. Okay, what I was saying was that we need to see 
how we can uh, the, the problematic inherently problematic celebrations you just have to let go of if you had been celebrating them before that's it there's no there's no option over here the ones that are legally not problematic right wedding celebrations are not an issue but rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that the best wedding is the most simple wedding right so i was saying that because of the covid situation some people alhamdulillah were following the sops and had simple nikahs alhamdulillah wonderful but if you want to have some you know a little bit of a song or whatever you know girls can get together women can get together or guys can get together separately if they want to and have a little you know dolki the party whatever you want to call it and even in that you can't just be randomly mm, singing whatever you want or having like a dikki chika dikki chika going on right if you if, if you think about it in the in back in the day right there used to be songs like bana mera eid ka chand and i'm talking about our pakistani indian cultural context right simple sweet wedding songs now they have been replaced by these bollywood item numbers so even if it is a girls get together the template change would be that i cannot have a bollywood or whatever would uh, item number or any any kind of vulgarity because what is that that is problematic isn't it so actually the guidelines for celebrating are pretty simple they are not such an issue right it's just because you see our team is not prescribed sometimes we feel we see all of these mushrik celebrations you know color and uh, uh, music and dancing and <clears throat> feeling so this if you if you ask me and we feel oh god now what am i supposed to do should i just sit in a corner and read surah al fatiha or all the time yeah alhamdulillah may allah subhanahu wa taala give us a tawfiq but the thing is that yes you can have celebrations yes you can have celebrations in occasions as well but keep within the limits of the sharia keep within the limits of the sharia as simple as that when we look at the example of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so for example rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was entering medina the young girls of the uh, of his naniyal of his mother's side of the family uh they sang this very very famous song talaul badru alaina those of you who are familiar a little bit familiar with the uh, uh with the seerah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so they were so happy at his coming that they celebrated that alhamdulillah they were they were they were using the daf there were these young girls and the uh, and the content uh, the the wordings of the songs were beautiful right it was not like a, a, a an orchestra that was playing with stringed instruments and all of that none of that right so alhamdulillah if you want to celebrate a wedding right alhamdulillah there are so many people and, and many young people are very woke these days uh, you see on social media that certain uh, this young couple they decided that on their walima they kind of uh, went to i think kachi basti or something like that and they had that lovely walima over there fed everybody and all it could be anything it could be anything and uh, keep it simple share it don't do isra don't overspend right don't celebrate stuff whether it's a birthday or a wedding yeah or i'm talking about something which can be celebrated right and you you want to change the template for that in a way that would make other people jealous in a way that would be overboard right don't do that that's cheap that's vulgar stay away from that that is not part of being a believer a believer doesn't want to make another person jealous or show off what they have right and little little children we are making them greedy brats i want an ipad how old are you 5 years old what uh, uh, like you know uh, no discourage all of this discourage all of this in when it comes to celebration right even if it is A, a nursery graduation or a kindergarten graduation they should not be getting an ipad they are little babies right so uh, i don't know some mothers are going to be like yeah sure uh, how am i going to keep them occupied or whatever yeah no look at what the greatest celebration the time for greatest celebration for rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the sahaba was fath makkah fath makkah when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the sahaba 
after blood and sweat and literally sheer human struggle they came to that point right the muslim army was advancing and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was riding his she camel and he was wearing a thick turban around his head right he lowered his head in humility to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and bent his back on the camel showing great modesty the large and solemn procession there was no dhol dhamaka bhangra happening yeah large and solemn procession that carried him towards the bottom of the sacred precincts and the armored corps that uh, corps that surrounded him both awaited a gesture to act and end the peace and mercy and these are people returning home who had been severely prosecuted bilal uh, rabbi allah on is among among them habab ibn arath rabbi allah taala and is among them yeah who were severely tortured right <clears throat> this manifest conquest reminded the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam of a very eventful past right how he had been driven out and how he returned in victory and support on that day what a great honor from allah subhanahu wa taala and allah subhanahu wa taala uh, that allah subhanahu wa taala bestowed on him and rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam felt these blessings the more humility and bowing he showed on his she camel now muslims enter makkah with the announcement that even he who enters the house of abu sufyan will be safe he who lays down arms will be safe he who locks his door will be safe so after the conquest rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam a the way he and the army entered the city as conquerors right and b did not take any revenge nor did he did he let uh, anyone else harm anyone open amnesty was announced for everyone open amnesty cut to cut to world war 2 hmm? uh after germany was defeated yeah and uh, germany and their allies were defeated and uh russia and their allies you know united states or the, the allies whatever entered germany it was predominantly the russian army but also uh, at normandy the the uh, the americans and the british and what have you they all kind of went in uh, but they were they landed in france and russian army came into was the first to enter uh, uh, germany i would really suggest that those of you who don't have a, 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 a don't have a weak stomach look at the history not at hollywood films about world war 2 yeah girls as young as 10 years old up to women as old as 80 80 plus were massively mass rapes happened that was the way of, they would get drunk german women would commit suicide when they heard news that uh, uh, the armies were were advancing because when you have this high of victory you go completely out of control and you desperately need guidance at that time times of celebration right any kind of victory whether i mean you know like for example somebody is getting married that is a kind of like you know a, a, a new station in life etc look at the difference the islamic perspective and what happens otherwise this is an extreme i'm giving you extreme examples because it's important to understand the extreme examples and the reason why we need to look at these examples is because we go completely mad and crazy and our heads twist around when any kind of uh, event happens in our homes for example and weddings or birthdays or any other celebration even graduation parties sometimes or any other you know whatever celebration we need to keep our heads straight we need to keep our focus on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala بہادر شاہ ظفر سیڈ واٹ ظفر آدمی اس کو نہ جانیے گا وہ وہ کیسا ہی صاحب فہم و ذکا جسے عیش میں یاد خدا نہ رہے سیلیبریشن از واٹ اٹس کائنڈ آف این عیش نا واٹ یو کال عیش ان انگلش اٹ از لائک ایکزیوبر دیٹ از دا وے آف اے بلیور ان سیلیبریٹنگ اینی تھنگ 
right? Sift out the inherently haram and completely stay away from it. Completely stay away from it. Nothing, you know, if if a Valentine's Day celebration is happening in your child's school, go and say that, no, my child will not participate. Tough thing to do, huh? Not easy. Not easy, right? But doable. Alhamdulillah, doable. And as as parents, we generally worry about, you know, so my child is going to be ostracized, so my child is going to be bullied. No, give that confidence to your child. And you can only give that confidence to your child if you have that confidence yourself. If you are not breaking under the pressure, right? A lot of times, alhamdulillah, we try our level best to be Allah wale. Otherwise, right? Come a wedding, come a celebration, come any event, and we completely lose it. We forget about it. One one dinner in our house, and the first thing we said, Jaldi se ki namaz right? How many of us have said that so many times? Just one dinner in the house, right? No, not even a huge thing. Just one dinner in the house. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us the etiquettes of celebration, etiquettes of victory. In Surah An Nasr, glorify the praises of your Lord and seek his forgiveness. Do we ever do that at a birthday celebration? Do we ever tell the child who we are asking to blow the candles in one breath? Right? Do we ever say, say Alhamdulillah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this absolute beautiful, beautiful gift of life? Right? Or do we celebrate with this dua for our child that Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept him safe or kept her safe with health and you know all intact do we do that and do we do a safar at events or celebrations in our life this is the etiquette of celebration for a believer right? somebody said which is so true true religion is commitment not just faith how much do you believe in something is manifested only by what you're willing to risk for it. Doesn't matter if everybody else has a very specific template to celebrate certain things. And if you feel and you know, right, and you have researched and you have sat in class about, no, 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 this is problematic. Then you can't be part of that. Huh? We do have this need to fit in. We do have this need to fit in. But then Allah wale are Allah wale. And the power of submission is such that things get clarified in our hearts and in our heads. Right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills to guide, he opens his breasts for Islam. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills to guide someone, yashrah uh, lil Islam. We should pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Open my heart to to the nuances of this being. Whenever there is an opportunity to celebrate, and generally there's planning, right? Before a wedding, there is planning. Before a, uh, oh my God, they're planning before a wedding or not. Some, I remember once many years ago, there was this one lady, a, a good friend of mine actually, all over the place. Like, you know, she was frazzled and about to have a nervous breakdown. And somebody asked her, what's the matter? My daughter is about to get married. When? Next year. What? You're going to prepare for a whole year, 12 months, right? Yeah, I can understand that maybe you have to book a venue or whatever, 12 years. But like, you know, we go the hysterical and nuts over preparation. But do we ever look at a preparation other than from the worldly angle? Yeah, we have to brace ourselves for that. We have to prepare ourselves for that. So if my child is getting married or I am getting married or it is my graduation party or it is my birthday party or it is, I don't know, uh, 14th August, or, or, or I'm talking about the national holiday in Pakistan, or whatever commemoration, right? How am I going to deal with it? What am I going to do? We need to plan that. That is an, that is an action plan that we, we need to have. And we must understand this was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life 
which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 162. Kul, say, my beloved Prophet, inna shalati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Indeed, my prayer and my uh, nusuki and my acts of devotion and worship and my living and my dying are all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lusuki is also uh, sacrificed, right? So all other uh, sacrifice and devotion is all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My living and my dying, all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So celebrations are part of my living, right? So if they are going to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first thing is going to be gratitude that I have, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me this opportunity of celebrating something, whatever it is, whatever, whatever it is, whether it's a wedding or a birthday or a graduation or a national holiday or you know, uh, my brother or sister coming home uh, from abroad after, I don't know, 20 years. Yeah, a lot of times, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up this dunya again and we have this opportunity to get together with family and friends like we used to before. And uh, uh, inshallah, inshallah, give us the guidance and the, uh, and the aql and the hearts to celebrate the way we are supposed to. Right? The way that would be approved by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Uh, there is someone, again, like I said, not a Muslim. I was reading this article the other day, which was, right, which was wonderful. What she was talking about, she's a psychologist, and she was talking about uh, uh, something that, why is it that we celebrate? And we're talking about general celebration. She has said, I have punctuated some great little life moments, right? When a client gave me a job well done, when I secured a new assignment, when I found the thing I've been looking for all week, quietly alone in my office over a cup of coffee. And that works too, because any celebration, big or small, is really about taking a beat to notice the good stuff in your life. I thought that was so beautiful. It's like the beat to notice the good stuff in your life. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this time out from our mainstream uh, way of life to think where we are going. It can also, and then she goes on to say, it can also be a reminder of our talents and abilities, skills and persistence. Drawing on those things can motivate us to keep working towards our goals. So these are little moments of celebrations that we can have because these moments of celebration make us pause and be mindful and that boosts our well-being, right? So according to social psychology researchers, when we stop to savor the good stuff, we buffer ourselves, ourselves against the bad and we build resilience. But unfortunately, the popular templates of celebrations are such that we exhaust ourselves, right? We become absolute emotional wrecks right? Instead of that being a source of energy, a source of savoring the good stuff, and for a believer, what would that be? A source of shukr, a time of shukr, of savoring all the wonderful family and friends that are around you, right? And then she goes on to say, even mini celebrations can plump up the positive emotions, which make it easier to manage the daily challenges that cause major, major stress. And when we make our celebrations into major stresses, then that becomes seriously problematic. Now, with social media time, we have made it a double whammy that not only should I sell, thou shalt celebrate and thou shalt record it and thou shalt share it with everybody and wait for the validation. Allah, why do we do that? Such pressure, such anxiety, such stress, right? When we have something to look forward to, or look ahead to something worth celebrating, we feel more optimistic. Right? So you don't need decorations or presents to savor a great moment, right? What she's suggesting, this lady, is notice the moment. What is it that you're proud of? What have you achieved today? What do you like about your life? Where is your good energy flowing? Notice what is working in your life and you'll find something to celebrate, right? And you'll find something to celebrate. And the second thing that she's saying is, move out of the routine 
and set the scene. Now stop. You can go to a special place in your home or a beautiful location outside, right? Balcony, garden or whatever. And give your attention to the moment of goodness or achievement. I thought these were just such beautiful little pointers, right? And these are totally Sharia compliant, by the way. There's nothing wrong in that. When we work ourselves up for that quote-unquote grand celebration, right? We are working towards anxiety and stress and falling flat on our faces. There are so many brides and so many grooms, which I who are just totally stressed out on their wedding day. Or dula or dulan ki amma ka tagar baati na kare, right? Whatever you celebrate, set the moment apart by stepping out of your routine for just a few minutes, right? And the third thing that she's saying is commemorate the moment, right? Now take some action. And you know what she's saying? She's saying, say a prayer. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, right? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen for a believer, right? What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying over here? Where did that ayat go? Glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say a prayer, right? Eat a special food. Uh, yeah, that, that I love. Nothing wrong in having special food. Nothing wrong in doing that. And then she, she talks about her husband who says that he, he says that uh, um, he comes home on Friday and he says, it's the weekend. Yeah. And then the two of us, we pretend that we aren't middle-aged parents who go to bed by nine and we sit in the kitchen and toast each other Friday and the week's accomplishment. We enjoy the moment and act like there is something big worth celebrating. We don't do that with little things, do we? We don't. We only want to celebrate something which we can show off about or something that a lot of money is spent. You don't need to do that. And then we are teaching our children that as well those types of expectations for any celebration in life. Those types of ex expectations. Well, children have become strange, right? right? Uh, I shouldn't say that. That's not nice. But some children, because the parents have set up the expectations so high for them, so they do a little achievement. Alhamdulillah, children's achievement must be appreciated, must be rewarded. But does it have to be like a, a I don't know, a, a fancy bike or a, a, or a fancy gadget? Right? Gone are the days of going out for ice cream for celebration or ordering pizza or something, you know, whatever. Good enough. Let's stop being so materialistic in everything. Let's stop it. And let's try very hard to keep it simple, to keep it mindful, right? To have people who are less fortunate involved in that. Alhamdulillah, we live in that part of the world and all of us are so privileged, so privileged. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take our hisab easy. We are so privileged that we have people working for us. Should they not be part of the celebration? Right? Or should they just be working and slogging in the kitchen like mad because you are feeding like a seven-course dinner to 500 people? Think about all these things. That is the way of a believer. So when we understand the of our deen, when we understand what it is to be a believer, when we understand then should I celebrate my birthday, should I not celebrate my birthday, should I celebrate Halloween, should I not celebrate Halloween, what should I do, do at this occasion, what should I not do at this, this occasion, should I have a mehndi or should I have a mahi or should I have a dholki, all these issues are going to be sorted out, believe me. You need to understand. Have I taken the first step to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is this going to be my mantra in life? Kul inna shalati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. If yes, then alhamdulillah, your, half your uh, struggle is gone. And nobody is saying that all of your struggle is going to be gone. Nobody is saying that it's not going to hurt when you are going to say no to going to your sister's son's wedding because of certain elements that you know are going to be there and you're not going to attend the Mayu. It is going to hurt, right? There are certain celebrations which you will need to give up, but then see what you're giving it up for. See whose sunnah you're going to follow, right? A lot of times 
you don't just need a fatwa. You need taqwa. Right? We have become, according to one scholar, he said something beautiful. He said that we have become millet-less Muslims, genetically modified, like seedless watermelons. You don't want to be that. You want to be, a, to the best of your ability, practicing, proud Muslimah. So as a Muslim woman, when I find it difficult to look like a Muslim woman in public, then celebrations to then come later on. Na? Where is that pride, Nardeen? If we think something is precious, if we think something is worth following, then we have pride in that. Na? We have pride in that. And we must, must, must all pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, Allah taj'ali dunya akbar hamina. Oh Allah, don't make this dunya our biggest concern. Because it is this dunya that we run after. It is those formulas that we are running after. Somebody else has told us to do that. Half of the time, it's quite possible that you don't even want to do certain things and certain celebrations and you end up doing it because, oh, that's how it is done. That is how it is done. Just this, just this morning, I was talking to someone and she said that there was a wedding in her family and there were so many issues and it was, uh, I'm, I'm assuming a COVID uh, uh, SOP followed kind of wedding because people were making phone calls for congratulations or whatever. So there was this huge issue about that somebody just sent a text message and they didn't call to say congratulations. Or there are these kind of issues, right? That somebody just called and didn't send a gift. Or somebody sent a gift, but it wasn't good enough. Somebody, oh my goodness. It's the never ending. It's all dunya, 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 dunya. It's all for other people. It's all for showing off, right? These are the things that you and I need to stay away from. Celebrate that Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. I got up for Fajr today on time. Celebrate. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. I did all of my salahs today on time without wasting time. Right? Is that a cause for celebration for me? Is that a cause for celebration for me? That today, that sunnah of Fajr, Allahu Akbar Kabira, that that cause of celebration you don't need to share with anybody else. I had quoted this person saying, why do people get attached so much to made up stuff? And then manufacture emotions to support that attachment. That, that is so true. Because there is this societal expectation, this peer pressure, we give into that. And we ourselves are unaware of why am I doing this? Why is it that I'm doing this? So perhaps one year you did celebrate your birthday, the other year you don't. Not such a big deal, is it? Right? Not such a big deal. When we have a framework of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of us. When we have this complete focus on the akhirah, only then can we let go of the frivolous activities of this dunya. And majority of celebrations that we get involved in are frivolous activities of this dunya. But because we are a middle nation, we are a middle ummah, we are a balanced, we need to have a balanced approach so no astaghfirullah haram to everything and no yes, 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 this is also okay to everything. Have an examined approach. Have an approach based on knowledge and based on taqwa. And based on taqwa. So if you have chosen that for your child and for yourself that we are not going to celebrate birthdays in our family, alhamdulillah, not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. Don't let another person pressurize you into doing that. And if you have chosen that, yes, I think I will celebrate birthdays in my family, then make sure that you see what are the contents of that celebration. It's extremely important. And I will repeat again, certain celebrations which are inherently problematic, following a, a polytheistic belief, other religious celebrations, then please don't go around wishing everybody Merry Christmas and Happy Diwali and Patani, what else and all. Don't. Don't do that. There is no need to do that. And that doesn't mean that you should 
because you see, again, we go to extreme. That doesn't mean that you're preaching hatred at all. Allahumma la taj'al dunya akbara hamnina. Allahumma la taj'al dunya, taj'al dunya akbara hamnina. And pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, make peace for me to understand this deen completely. Allahumma faqihna fi Ya Allah, give me the ability to sift through the baqil and reach to the haqq. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa warzuqna tiba. Oh Allah, show me haqq as it is haqq and give me the tawfiq to follow it. Wa arina al-baqil 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 warzuqna tinaaba. And show me the baqil, the false, the way it is false and how false it is and give me the ability to stay away from it. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen, Ya Bafuru Rahim, Ya Rahman Rahimeen, Ya Zal Jalali Wal Ram, Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasukun, Wa Salamun Ala Al Mursaleen, Wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We have exactly four minutes left. If anybody has a question pertinent to what we have discussed, please feel free to ask. Right? Don't ever be embarrassed to ask questions. Because somebody asked this question, and therefore, Alhamdulillah, we had this discussion. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it has clarified in our minds and in our hearts certain issues that have been that have been bothering us. Right? And as usual, if you feel that you don't want to ask right now, please never be shy of sending in your questions and inshallah we'll try to sort it out for you to the best of our ability as soon as possible. So if there are any questions, we do have three minutes. Oh, somebody has typed something, okay. Please share the dua in the group. Okay, sure, I will. Mrs. Siddiqui, inshallah, I will. And you know, dua does wonders. It really, truly does. A little bit of knowledge and a lot of dua. I mean, transformative effect, inshallah, inshallah, right? But we do have to take that first step into realizing where to get involved, where not to get involved, what to celebrate and what not to celebrate, right? Anybody else? Any other questions or comments or concerns that any one of you might have? No? Okay. Jazakallah khair and kathir for your time. Inshallah, see you next Wednesday and we will continue our discussion on Surah Al Anfal. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yashikun, Wa Salamun Ala Al Mursaleen, Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma Rabbana Jalla Minhum, Aladina Aman Wamil Shwali Hats. وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين يا غفور الرحيم يا رحم الرحيم يا ذل جلالي والإكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته